Okay, well, um, if you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and take them out and head to the book of John this morning. We're going to have a, a Christmas message. Um, we're having a Christmas service on Christmas Eve night. We'll also be, be looking at, at uh, the birth of our Lord. But this morning, we really wanted to take some time, especially, especially during this time, to really get before us the heart of Christmas. And I know we, most of us, we know what it's all about. We know the importance of it. But to capture the glory of it, I think that's another thing. And that's what I want to look at this morning. You'll notice, if you're in John, you'll notice in verse 14 of chapter 1, It says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. This was written by the Apostle John, not to be confused with John the Baptist. The Apostle John who wrote five books of the New Testament. The Apostle John who previously to his growth and development in his relationship with God was known as the son of thunder, um, wanted to call down heaven, uh, fire from heaven on people that he didn't like. That guy turned into a guy who didn't, didn't really like to refer to himself by his name, but liked to refer to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He just was sort of captivated by the fact of this person that he had come in contact with, the gravity of who he was and what he did, and then the relationship that he had with him, he was just sort of blown away by that. And so we'd often read about him as a guy who he would say the disciple whom Jesus loved. We picture him, we get pictures of him just sort of close to Jesus, laying on Jesus, communing with Him, fellowshipping with Him. Now, this picture, this this is a, a picture of someone who is so touched by the glory of God that it, it melted Him, basically. It changed Him. It transformed Him. And he, he writes this statement in verse 14 of John 1, Speaking of what theologians like to call the incarnation, basically that God became flesh. God became a man. Again, he says, and the word became flesh and and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And so John, as he's writing this gospel, the fourth gospel, he's writing it so that we would get a, a a better understanding of the godness of God, that we would be sort of captivated by the deity of God, and that that God, in His godness, at the same time, became a man. So that whole idea is really what Christmas is all about, that God became a man. At the end of this book, in John 20, 30, he says, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, here's the purpose of the whole book, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The whole purpose of the book was to to give us an understanding of the godness of God in his Son, Jesus Christ, and then that there would be a reaction or a response on our behalf because of that, that we would believe in our reaction or belief in who God is, in all of His godness, 
even though he was a human being, that then that we would have life. So there is a, a reaction that John had in his life to God, to Jesus. There's a reaction. And it was this reaction that every day for him was Christmas. Because every day for him, Jesus was his Lord and Savior. And it's really important when you read John's writings to, to capture the heart of John and to be taken up with how he was taken up and to pray that we too would have that same sort of awe that John had, that, that sense of God's glory that he basked in. And so that's what we want to look at this morning, beholding the glory. Notice in verse 1, we're going to work our way from John 1.1 1, 1 to verse 18. The first thing that we find here is, is John then, he's explaining the, the glory of illumination. Notice what he says. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was that light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. As he starts the Gospel of John, he, he wants, to, wants to bring us back to the identity of Jesus. Because to get to verse 14, where he says we, he was beholding the, the glory, we beheld the glory, we have to understand where that glory originated and where it came from. And so right off the bat, we get this this, this wording that sounds a lot like the very first book of our Bible, Genesis. He no doubt is thinking about the very first verse of our Bible, in the beginning God in the book of Genesis, speaking of the creation that God created. But I want you to notice, and, and the idea, the goal is for us here this morning is first in our minds, to be taken up with this glory of the light that came into the world. So he says, in the beginning was the Word. Now it's an interesting phrase or name, Word, that's a name. We learn from the book of Revelation, chapter 9, verse, or, or chapter 19, verse 13. It says, speaking of Jesus, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So another name for Jesus is the Word. So he says, in the beginning was the Word, before anything material existed, was the existence of Jesus. And he says, and, and that word was with God. So there is a, a association now of the word and God. There was a connection that existed before anything else existed, anything that we know. And it says, and the word was God. It's very important to note that because here we have a very clear defining statement that Jesus was God, always was God, never was not God. And in this statement we find that, that Jesus had a relationship with the Father before even time began. 
But I want you to notice in, in verse 2 something interesting. He says, he was in the beginning with God. It sounds like a, a repeat of that statement. But what he's stressing here is that, that Jesus was in the beginning, that he was with God. There was a, some sort of relationship there. And that Jesus was God. And then he says he was in the beginning with God, meaning and stressing that there is this relationship between God the Father and God the Son. And what's important to realize in verse 2, this relationship was one that existed for all of eternity. Meaning it was a, a relationship of union and nature of essence. It, it wasn't a relationship like one day they met each other and became friends. It was a relationship of sameness, of oneness. That's why he's repeating that in verse 2. In the, in the beginning... He was with God, that they, in essence, were the same. So we start to get this development of the Trinity here. The Trinity that, that God is one, going all the way back into the Old Testament when God created everything, that word that we have for that, where it says that in Genesis 1, 27 through 29, it says, let us make man in our image, plural. It was the, the word Elohim, which means there's, there's a ref reference to two or more. It wasn't a singular or dual, but it was one God in three persons. That's the Trinity. Here we have that spelled out. This is Trinitarian type of statement that we're monotheists, meaning we believe in one God, absolutely. There's no question about that, but that one God is in three distinct separate people. This is what he's spelling out here. He's, he's trying to get us to understand the glory of God wasn't just a mere emanation of God or a lower level God or a representative or a messenger per se of God. What he's saying is in the most profound words that we can say, and these are some of the most profound words that we have in our whole Bible He's saying that Jesus clearly, undeniably, is the God without beginning. He's saying He is the great I Am. And He's saying that that God, in verse 3, to make it even more clear, He says, all things were made through Him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Again, now stressing the deity of God being that he is the creator of all. Within this text, we can also see that Jesus was not created. Because all things were created through him. All things means all, everything. So Jesus is the source of all creation. He is God that was existent before time began as we know it. And then in verse 4, he says, In Him was life. And that life was the light of men. So now... Jesus, again, another expression of his godness or his deity was that now he is the source of life. And if you think about that, it's a, a very interesting thing because 
people have a hard time defining what, what life is. If you were to look at the, the difference between a, a corpse and a person that was alive, what, what is that difference? They both have bodies. And they both have the same body parts and things you can identify, but there's something tangible, this life. There's something different between a, a live tree growing and thriving and cells duplicating. Well, what is that? What makes that happen versus a, a dead tree? Jesus is the source of, the, of very life. Again, another expression of his deity or his godness. That all life comes from Jesus. And that says that then Jesus must be the giver, sustainer of all life, all the living. And then he says that life in verse 4, it was the light of men. Knowing that sin brings death and darkness and separation from God, Jesus now, being the source of light, is working through his incarnation to bring about life to all of mankind. The importance of what we celebrate on Christmas is the importance of life being born into this world so that we could have life. Verse 5, he says, And the light, it shines in darkness. And Jesus came into the world that the, the Bible says is a, a place of darkness, a place where it's hard to see spiritual things clearly. Jesus was born in a time where there were silent years between God speaking through prophets and men had become feeling distant to God, going back to and holding tight to just simply memories and understandings and rituals without the, the life of God lighting their path on a daily basis. But it says, notice in verse 5, it says, The light, it shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So as Jesus came into the world, there was some identification of Jesus. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. His disciples had understanding of, of who he is, but is always sort of, Surrounded by this, is, he, is that really him? Is this really the Messiah? There is this a bit of confusion, an identification of this person that came into the world and those who were close to this person knew that, that Jesus came miraculously through uh, being birthed without an uh, earthly father the Holy Spirit impregnating his mother. And this birth of a Savior and the wise men came and gave honor to him, but it, it wasn't until he fulfilled his mission that people knew the full glory of who was right in front of him. It wasn't until his death and then resurrection that it was very clear of the glory of this Savior. Now, we may ask ourselves, if John was so thrilled about Jesus, he beheld Jesus, he was taken back, does he have an advantage that we don't have? Does, does John, when he talks about in, in 1 John that that he wants to join us and catch us up in this relationship that he had with Jesus so that our joy may be full? How do we do that? As we sit here today, can we say, well, it was easy for John to do that because he walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He sat 
on Jesus's bosom and rested his head and enjoyed fellowship with him. He saw the miracles. He spent that time with him in prayer. And so how do we do that? And that's the question I found myself asking as as I read this and thought about it. How do we behold the glory of the Lord? There's some interesting information that we get in John's letter in 1 John chapter 1 that explains this. In 1 John chapter 1, I'll read it for you. You see the similar language, but he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes. So we haven't done that, have we? Which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So John's saying to his audience, he says that there was... This connection that I had with Jesus that I'm explaining to you that he was a real person in flesh and blood, that God came into this world, that we touched him, we held him. He was physical, he was tangible. And he says that in verse 2, that life was manifested... And we have seen and we are now bearing witness and declaring to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, now we're declaring it to you so that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So he's he's writing, knowing that he had a certain experience with Jesus, that the people reading or the people he's talking to would not be able to have that same tangible, physical experience with Jesus. But yet he's saying, I want you to join in to this fellowship, to partake of God in the way that I am. And he's not just saying the physical part. What he's saying is that the physical part led to something that we can all join into now. And that as we join into this relationship, this fellowship with God, which translates to fellowship with other believers... That is where our joy will be full. You see what he's getting at? So how do we behold the glory of God then? That's the question. Beholding the glory of God now is possible because Jesus said, when I go, when I leave, when I ascend, I'm I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Jesus said that his physical presence with them, that there would be a time where that wouldn't be so anymore because he had to die. He had to raise again from the dead through the resurrection, making the way possible for a certain type of relationship that translates itself beyond the physical. And what that is, is Jesus said, now I will give you the Holy Spirit. There's a third member of the Trinity. I will give you the Holy Spirit. And now with the Holy Spirit living in you, it won't be a a God living outside of you like he was with John. It'll be God living inside of you. And he said, now that is the way that you and I will Behold the glory of God. And there is a bit of advantage to that. See, there are times when when Jesus would, like, say, go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. All the disciples didn't go with him. They wanted to. But the, all the disciples, so the, being physically present with Jesus when he was here was, was amazing. 
But at the same time, Jesus was sort of clothed in a human body. So we learn it wasn't uh, the physical appearance of Jesus that was so mind-blowing. It wasn't like he, he looked like this great being from heaven in all of his glory where the Old Testament says that we can't look at God the Father. That we wouldn't be able to, to be able to look at his glory, just like Moses asked that. And God, he had to hide in a rock and Jesus passed by, or God the Father passed by and he looked at his afterglow. But that was a picture for us as Jesus is the rock that is we're hidden in Christ in relationship with him. We behold the glory of the Father. Do you see what I'm getting at? The way God is working now is that the finished work of his son Jesus Christ has allowed the continuing work of Jesus to go forward in the hearts of men through the Holy Spirit. So that now the glory of God, we behold it every day and every day is Christmas because of the gift of his Holy Spirit. And that is then where you and I behold the glory of God. In the book of Luke, it, it says that the kingdom of God is within us. And so we have this gift of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, living inside of us, lighting up the glory of God to us in intimate fellowship and relationship that Jesus made possible at the cross. The second point we notice is found in verse 10. It says in verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him. That's pretty powerful. And the world did not know him. Verse 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many, in verse 12, as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So he speaks about now, he speaks about the glory of this new birth. Not only is it the glory of illumination and light in the sun that brought about the truth of heaven to us, but now he talks about the glory of a new birth. He, he's speaking about how now we get to the place where we enjoy that fellowship with God. And you'll notice here in the text, he says that the work of Jesus, being as it is, must be received in order to be enjoyed. So Jesus did the work of being born into the world, living a perfect, sinless life. He did that. And then taking our place at the cross, suffering for our sins. He did that. And then raising again from the dead. But see, now there's a responsibility. You'll notice here in the text, verse 12, as many as has received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And so the, the work of Jesus Christ then must be, it says here, must be received. So there must be something on our end that we do with what Jesus did. And that's where we now get down to the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ the good news of Jesus Christ. 
that whoever would believe on him would not perish but have eternal life. Now this, this receiving is important to know that, that there has to be then this connection that we have with God. So the gospel could be something that is but not ours. The question is, have we participated in the gospel, in the work of Jesus Christ? Have we participated in that? That's the key. And so he's specifying here really clearly, and he's almost begging and urging, based on what he personally knew. Imagine being John, and imagine walking with Jesus, seeing his miracles, still being a little unclear about who he is, but you're knowing something's really, really different about this guy. And then seeing him die, knowing he was innocent and he shouldn't have died. And then as he's dying, you're starting to remember some things that Jesus said about himself, that some of the picture is starting to become a little more clear, but you're, you're still not quite getting it because it doesn't seem right that God would have to die. It doesn't seem right that an innocent person would have to die. So you're, you're sort of getting a hold of this picture. You're feeling broken and sad because of this friend that you've gone so, so close to, this friend that brought you in, that took care of you, that loved you, that had these unique qualities. He's dying on the cross, and you're dejected, and you're, you're thinking, oh, my hope was in this person that I thought would be a world ruler, that he would make me high up in his kingdom, and I was so excited, and now he's dying. And your hope would be dashed until the day that Mary said, hey, the, the tomb's empty. And then you, you, you and Peter would sprint to the tomb, and you'd look in there. Jesus wouldn't be there. And you'd try to figure out how he could have gotten out there. You saw him, he was dead. There's no way he could have not been dead. And they sealed the tomb and they guarded it. And now he's not there. And then your hopes are starting to come back and you're starting to realize, hey, this is what Jesus said he was going to do. And then the teachings of Jesus and then the, the truth of Jesus and then who he was, he's not dead. He was just dead for a moment. And now he's alive even more than ever. And I remember in John 14, he said he wasn't going to leave us as orphans. Oh yeah, that's how he's going to do it now. And so he's going to send his Holy Spirit. And hey, wait, now I actually see Jesus alive again. I see the scars in his hand. Yep, that's him. He's alive now. He's telling me to go wait in Jerusalem. So I'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. But he wanted to talk to Peter first because Peter had rejected him. And so he met with Peter. They had a barbecue and Jesus restored him after he died. And Jesus is coming and going. He's ascending to heaven. He's coming back. He's talking with people, eating with people. People are touching him. And then he says, go wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the Holy Spirit came upon them at Jerusalem. And people were amazed at what happened to these individuals who the Holy Spirit had descended upon. And it was then that John knew, that he understood, I got it now. That now this fellowship that I had with Jesus physically, now I have it spiritually, the Holy Spirit is living inside of me. I am filled with joy in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I am walking with Him now. And now He's saying, I want you to all have that. He's saying, I touched Him. I saw Him. I beheld Him. I slept on His bosom. I spoke with Him. We were close. And that one died and He rose again. The Holy Spirit came upon me. 
Now I want you to have that. Now he's begging us. He's saying, come on in and join the party. Come on in and be a part of this. And then he's speaking of the importance then of the new birth in Jesus Christ. That the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are, be, are made new. All the old is passed away. And what he's saying is now we have the spirit of God living inside of us. We're no longer slaves to darkness and sin in our old life, but he's made us brand new in Jesus Christ. That every day is Christmas. Every day we're filled with the hope of Jesus Christ, the love and the joy. And so he's saying, as he said, in, as Paul said in the book of Romans, he said, now walk in the newness of life. Don't go back to that old way of living. He said, now you have the Holy Spirit. There's life, spiritual life. You're connected to heaven through Jesus Christ. Now live in that newness of life. And then he finishes off in verse 14. Speaking about the glory of grace. He says in verse 14, And the Word became flesh. There's the incarnation. And dwelt or tabernacled among us. And here it is. And we beheld His glory the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, this is John the Baptist, not John the writer of this. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. And so the final point is in the glory of the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what that means is that it was all initiated by God. This story of salvation, this message of hope in Jesus Christ, this Christmas story that God would become a man, it was all by grace, meaning it was all of God's doing to give that God would be the giver, that God would be the bestower, that God would be the one. He does the action. And then we are simply the recipients of the greatest gift that could ever possibly happen to a human being in life, all because of what He has done. This Christmas... It's easy to see how this, what we talked about this morning, gets obscured by the commotion, right? It's hard. And as we think about, come back to the place where there's just this simplicity of, of just adoring Jesus. I'd like to, to give us a few tips to how to behold the glory of God before we go. The first one is how can we behold the glory? The first one is through creation. The Bible talks about how all creation speaks about God. I would encourage you and myself to take some time to really Get outside a little bit to enjoy things that God has made and God created. Maybe maybe get out of the mall a little bit. Maybe get out of the house a little bit. 
and get get to a place where, and and really begin to to look at things in a way where you're saying, "Wow, God, you're amazing." I know, I know. I've seen on some of your pictures on Facebook and whatnot of sunsets and snow and ice and lakes and all that. But it's really good to it's really good to get out. I know it's cold, bundled up, but just get out in creation. It's amazing what that does to our mindset, doesn't it? To look up a little bit, to get to just get out of the miry clay, so to speak. So that's the first thing is to to enjoy God's handiwork that speaks of Him. And think about God as we think about His creation. The second thing is reflection. Meaning, spend time meditating on who God is and what God has done. And I find that that practice is is a practice that brings about such great joy. It's, it's the practice of how the Bible talks about of taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It's, it's the practice of valuing God with our minds. It's the practice of loving God with our minds. Using our minds just to think about God. And I, I always just hope and pray in my my own life that God's the last thing I think about before I go to bed and the first thing I think about when I wake up. That my mind would just be so filled with meditation and reflection on God's goodness and His grace and mercy that I would be caught up in His glory that way. The third thing is devotion, meaning To understand God, we have to know Jesus. And to know Jesus, we have to know His Word. And so just to be in God's Word, to take time after you've been outside in the cold reflecting on His creation, come in, hopefully if you have a fireplace, and sit by that and open up your Bible and just enjoy God and the revelation of God through His Word. The third thing is communion, which was in First John, what John was reflecting and pointing to. When he says fellowship, he's talking about communion, koinonia, connection. And that could be the actually taking of communion, which we're going to do on Christmas Eve. You can do that in, our, in your own homes. Have communion with one another. Take time to do as Jesus said. Do this in remembrance of me. Just take time to to look at the the juice, the cup, and the the wafer, the cracker, and just take time to meditate and think about the gospel and what those things represent. And spend time just then allowing God to minister to you through the partaking of communion. The fifth thing is fellowship with other believers. It's amazing how God works in each believer's life. And as we gather together, we are able to experience different aspects of God in and through other believers in Jesus Christ. And so the Bible speaks about the the importance of fellowship, enjoying one another, that we are God's gift to one another, the importance of the body of Christ, the importance of fellowship and enjoying one another in the Lord. The sixth thing is sacrificially serving. So to do something that doesn't benefit you at all, you'll find in that that you will experience the glory of God because that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus served sacrificially. He did for the benefit of others. He was completely... 100% selfless. Go and just do something random for somebody. Go and serve in one way, shape, or form and experience the glory of God in that action. The seventh thing, we only have 25 of these, so (laughs) I'm just kidding. There's eight. The seventh thing 
is use your gifts. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God has given you a gift, a spiritual gift. And the Bible tells us to stir up that gift. In that gift is where we will find great glory. Because God has given us that gift to use. And the using of that gift brings about the glory of God in and through our life. Stir up your gift. And then the last thing is prayer. Beholding the glory of God through prayer. Whether that means you get together with your family, with people in the body of Christ, in times of fellowship, or in your personal time with the Lord, spending it in prayer. And if you will take these things to heart, driven first and foremost by the greatness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you will have the greatest Christmas ever because you will behold the glory of God. And you know that word behold? It's a special, specific word. It doesn't mean to take a quick look at. It means to inspect, to gaze upon longly, to continue to keep ourselves fixed on. And as we behold Jesus Christ, we will be filled with the glory of God as well. Amen? Let's pray.